Hello and welcome to the worship of God at First Baptist Church Weaverville. We are so glad that you are here today. You bless us with your presence, whether you are here in our lovely sanctuary or if you're worshiping from home today, know that you are an important part of our worship service and your spirit joins with our spirit through the power of God's Holy Spirit to bring us into a spirit of worship today. It is good for us to be together, to pray together, sing together, be silent together, listen together as we get our spiritual rejuvenation vitamins this morning to help us get through the week ahead. We are so glad that you are here. If you are worshiping from home, there is links in the video description below so that you can follow along with everything that goes on in our worship service today. So I encourage you to explore the information and the links that are there. One of those links is an online form to say hello and to introduce yourself if you're new to the area or new to the church. And if you're here in the sanctuary, there are pew welcome cards in the pew racks uh, for you to say hello, for us to get to know you a little bit and learn how we can be good neighbors to you and how you can bless us uh, by being a neighbor as well. There are a lot of things coming up in the life of our church this week I want to bring your attention to, uh, many of which are on the bulletin on the back. The first is tomorrow evening at 6.30, all church women of Weaverville are invited to get together at the Presbyterian Church, just a block down that way and on the left. And that was a group that met regularly before the pandemic, and they had paused two years ago, and now that things are a little better, they are resuming their meetings. So all women of the town, of the community, are invited at the Presbyterian Church tomorrow at 6.30. If you know you can come, uh, you can let Kathy Price know, and she will pass on uh, our numbers to them, because there will be some snacks that they'll be preparing, and they want to make sure that they have enough. So all women are invited to that tomorrow. And on Tuesday, it's our Big Questions Life Discussion Group that's meeting at Yellow Mug Cafe at 530. You can uh, eat a yummy dinner there with us as we ask big questions, or you can just uh, eat dinner beforehand and grab a latte or something. We always enjoy thinking about life and society and faith and work, uh, all those kind of good big questions to ask together. So looking forward to that this Tuesday at 530, Yellow Mug. Uh, Wednesday, our Wednesday dinner this week, the church will provide if anyone wants to share in it for $5. So if you want to sign up for $5, let Regina know before you leave so she can get enough. It'll be a baked potato buffet bar with dessert as well. So that's what's on the menu for this Wednesday. This Friday, the Weaverville Music Club will be putting on a concert here in our sanctuary. The Reuter Singers will be back, and they always put on a very lively and energetic program. So I'm looking forward to the Reuter Singers concert this Friday, 7 o'clock, here in the sanctuary. Also next Sunday, I want to put on your radar, there is a fun gathering of other good Baptist churches in our area. Uh, Western North Carolina Cooperative Baptists are getting together at Hominy Baptist Church in Candler. Next Sunday at 5 o'clock, there's going to be some bluegrass music, some barbecue to eat, and there will be the missionaries, Mina and Gennady Pagaisky, who visited here a few months ago. They will be there as well and will be giving an update on their mission work uh, after they left our place a few months ago. They went, it was like the next day, they flew to uh, Poland and were able to travel into Ukraine for the first time since the invasion to check on their ministry center in Kiev that had been bombed by the Russians. So they had safe travels, they've made it back, and they're going to be giving an uh, update report next Sunday, 5 o'clock, how many Baptists in Candler. So you can find information on that in our church e-newsletter last week and this week. And if you don't get the church e-newsletter, then you can sign up if you're watching at home. There's a link in the video description below or on our website homepage. The last announcement, it's not a fun activity announcement, but it is a good announcement of an activity that I do want to make you aware of. There will be a memorial service this Saturday for Miss Sybil Williams. Miss Sybil passed away early Friday morning, and we were very sad and surprised to hear 
uh, that news. So we will be hosting a memorial service here in the fellowship hall this Saturday at 11 o'clock. So uh, if you knew Sybil, you knew that she was nice and sweet and kind and classy. And we want to uh, remember her and um, minister to her daughter and her nieces and her family and have a chance to share and, uh, and celebrate Sybil's memory. So that will be this Saturday at 11 o'clock in the fellowship hall for Sybil Williams. Those are all of the news announcements for today, but the most important announcement is that you are here and that God's Holy Spirit is here with us and that God's Holy Spirit joins us all together from wherever you might be worshiping today. So as the prelude music plays, take advantage of that moment to settle yourself, to breathe deep and find God's peace, to let go of all that you have been clinging to this week, all the stress that has been weighing you down. As the music plays, let go of it and let it rise to the Lord and in return be filled with the Lord's peace. So come, let us worship the Lord together today. voices in praise as we stand to sing O Worship the King. is not the children's sermon. <laughs> Our scripture today is James 2, 
verses 1 through 8. It's found on page 981 in your pew Bible, if you'd care to follow along. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our Lord, the glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and you take notice of the one wearing fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while the one who is poor, you say, stand here or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who oppress you. Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law. According to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is the word of the Lord. In your prayers today and this week, I encourage you to be thinking about missionaries and the mission work that they do around the world, around our country, around our state and our community as well. This week, there is an emphasis and urging to be think there is an emphasis and urging to be thinking about those missionaries that we have the honor and privilege of supporting with our offerings and with our gifts. That's why there are special offering envelopes in the bulletin today for the offering for global missions. And we hear about incredible stories like the Pagaiskis who were here a few weeks ago and the the mission work that they have had to do even over Zoom with people uh, talking to them as bombs are falling. Uh, we hear of mission work done in Haiti after earthquakes, trying to build medical clinics. We hear about mission work in the Triangle area of a welcome place for refugees who come to the country and know no one or how to get resources. All of those great projects and more the way that God's kingdom is being built in so many neat ways, we have the honor of supporting and we get to make a difference and contribute to that work. We enjoyed last Wednesday talking about how the early first Christian church, the first time they ever sent missionaries, Paul and Barnabas, and then when they came back, they gave reports to the church about what God had done through them. So we talked last Wednesday about how um, energizing it is to hear about awesome mission work that's done in other places around the world that we have a hand in and how it can inspire us to be missionaries in this mission field here where we have been called. So I encourage you to be praying and thinking about um, how you can support and help missionaries in our state and around the world this week. If there are other concerns that are on your heart today, folks that you worry about, situations you are celebrating, all of those things God invites us to share. And our church invites you to share. If there is something that you are struggling with, know that we are here to struggle with you and to walk alongside you. The care ministry cards are in the pew racks and you can fill out whatever concern or praise is on your heart and even mark those to be kept confidential if you'd like, that's okay. And you can place those cards and offering envelopes in the offering boxes that are at the sanctuary exits when you leave. And if you're worshiping from home, there's a link in the video description below for an online prayer concern form. Know that all of those concerns will be prayed for this week. Let us pray. 
Oh God, we give you thanks for another day to be in your holy house, to be amongst your children, our church family, to support each other, to be supported by each other, to be reminded that we do not walk our life journey alone, but that the, the friendship and the love of our church family, the divine power of your Holy Spirit walks with us and sustains us as we go. As we face challenges or headaches or annoyances and frustrations or deep grief and loss, we're reminded that you are with us and that we are with each other. So when one is hurt, we all feel pain. And when one is struggling, we all yearn for better days ahead. We pray for folks like Diane as she continues to recover at home from pneumonia. We pray for Pam as she now recovers from surgery. We pray for Wilma and Fred and the big recovery that each of them is facing as they go through rehabilitation, physical therapy, and challenges. We pray for missionaries around the world in all of the different, amazing, wonderful ways that they show your love to others. It is such a joy and privilege to be a part of that work. We pray for folks this week who have lost loved ones, beloved friends, and family members, those in our church family that we have lost, for Sybil Williams and her sweet soul that now rests in heaven with you. We're thankful for her life and thankful that she is at peace. We pray for her daughter Revel and all of her family and friends who loved her. We also especially pray for the family of Clifton Robertson who died this weekend and his family as they grieve and process his death and the hole that it leaves in their lives. It is hard to figure out how to live and be alive when someone we have loved so long is no longer with us. It feels like a gap. So remind us, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit's strength is there to fill in that gap and that your arms of love are there for us and with us and that we are here for each other to walk and support as we go through the journey of life. We pray for ourselves that we might have the strength needed to be your witnesses here and to the ends of the earth. Amen. Let's stand as we sing for the fruit of all creation.
Let us pray. In our worldwide task of caring for the hungry and despairing, in the harvests we are sharing, God's will is done. O oh Lord, we are so thankful that we can be a part of your will of changing the world, caring for those who are hungry and those who are in despair. May we truly see it as an opportunity to leave a legacy and to make a difference. So we give now from what we have received from you, and we give it back to you so that you might take it and bless it and change people's lives here and around the world. Amen. Thank you so much, Jody and Heidi. That was like a ray of musical sunshine that we got to enjoy. Thank you, thank you. In our scripture passage last week, we read from Amos chapter 7, and in it, Amos had a vision from God, and the illustration that Amos used was of a plumb line and he said, this is the standard, people. You need to start living upright lives or else there will be bad consequences. And sad, sadly, the people of Israel did not meet that standard. So now Amos has another vision. And this one in chapter 8, the illustration that he uses is of a basket of ripe fruit. And you might think, oh, good. Everyone loves ripe fruit, right? But for this vision, you have to think about it from the fruit's perspective. So let's say you're a piece of fruit and you have reached the point in your life cycle where you have ripened as much as you are going to get. Well, then there's really only two options for you at that point. The first one is that some human or animal will snatch you up and gobble you up, or that you will just stay there on the vine and eventually rot and eventually fall off. So that's the idea for this vision. God says that Israel is not going to get any better. So now it's time. They're either going to get eaten up or they'll just rot away. Neither is good for them. So let's see what Amos says in chapter 8, verses 1 through 7 and 11 through 12. Hear now the word of the Lord. <clears throat> this is what the sovereign Lord showed me, a basket of ripe fruit. What do you see, Amos? He asked. 
A basket of ripe fruit, I answered. Then the Lord said to me, the time is ripe for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. In that day, declares the sovereign Lord, the songs in the temple will turn to wailing. Many, many bodies flung everywhere. Silence. Hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and the Sabbath be ended that we may market wheat? Skimping on the measure, boosting the price and cheating with dishonest scales, buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. The Lord has sworn by himself the pride of Jacob. I will never forget anything they have done. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Hmm. May God bless the reading of this holy word today. So that's a tough prophecy for the Israelites to have heard 2,600 years ago. For the image of fruit that it talked about, the New International Version translation that I was reading from calls it a basket of ripe fruit, which you heard. But other English Bible translations call it summer fruit. So maybe this was a basket of like figs or other things in the Middle East that would have been ripe and ready to pick in late summer. Maybe that's when Amos is delivering his prophecy, right when people had fresh fruit on their minds. They're bringing their crops to the market, and they're also bringing some of their harvest to church to give as offerings to God. And just like we do when we give part of our earnings to God in worship, they did the same thing. They did it for a slightly different reason than we do. We give our tithes and gifts and offerings because it's the right thing to do and because we want to make a difference and we want to contribute to the eternal building of the kingdom of heaven so that we can be a part of something bigger than ourselves. But the Israelites, they just gave offerings because they had to. It was a requirement for them. They were told that the only way to be forgiven by God was to bring specific offerings, either from your harvest or from your livestock, depending on what kind of bad thing you had done that week, and then offer them as sacrifices to literally pay for your mistakes. So that's what people are doing when Amos gets this vision almost like it was their membership fee in the kingdom of heaven. Pay your harvest dues on time, and not only will your soul be cleansed, but you'll also receive blessings in return, they thought. And at this point, a priest during the service usually would come out and promise definitively that God would now bring lots of rain in the fall to help their next year's crop. And everyone would have cheered and said, yay, that's exactly what we want God to do. That's great news. So that's what people are thinking as they bring in their offerings and their ripe fruit. They're thinking, oh yeah, this is going to get me in good with the Lord. Now it's all blessings, cha-ching, from here on out. But what do they get in return, according to Amos? They get some bad news. Amos says, the summer's done, the fruit has grown and ripened. Now it'll either rot or get eaten up and the same goes for you. Your country will be picked off too and it'll waste away, he says. Oof, which is really bad news indeed. So why, why is this going to happen? It was supposedly a booming time in Israel when the nation was prospering, crops were growing, and money-making people were making more money. 
So what's wrong? Well, the answer first came in verse 4. It said people are stepping on the poor and the needy, taking advantage of them. They are trying to fight poverty simply by getting rid of people who are poor and just moving the homeless away and out of sight so they don't have to see them anymore. And doing that made God mad. This whole prophecy is like a warning against mistreating the poor. God really hated it when they were shoved out or swindled or just forgotten. Then the next few verses give some specific examples of how the haves are cheating the have-nots. In verse 5, it said they are skimping the measure, boosting the price, and cheating with dishonest scales. So what that just means is that they were finding ways to be sneaky and underhanded with how much they might pay for their goods or they charged other people when selling their goods. For skimping the measure, you can think of it like in terms of a recipe. If a recipe calls for one cup of flour, it makes a big difference if that's one cup of scooped up flour with a big mound on top or one cup of flour that you level off nice and straight or one cup of flour that you pack down real tight and get as much in there. It makes a difference what kind of measure you use and you really need to know which one is called for or your pound cake is not going to turn out right. You know what I mean? It's important. So these wealthy merchants in Israel would find ways to kind of cut corners but still pretend like they were being fair. Or they would say, oh, we can measure with my trusty scale here. But their scale wasn't all trusty. Thinking about dishonest scales last week made me think of the news story two weeks ago of the fishermen who tried to cheat with how much their fish weighed. Did you hear that? Did you see that story in the news? It was quite something. It was two guys in a fishing competition in Cleveland, Ohio, and their haul of five fish seemed to weigh the most at the Lake Erie Walleye Trail Tournament. So they were on track to win the $29,000 grand prize, which is uh, an amount worth cheating for, they must have thought. But all the participants who were expert fishermen, they could tell that the weight on the scales was like twice as much as those fish should have weighed. So the tournament director picked up one of the fish and could feel hard objects inside the fish's body. So he got out a knife and started cutting them open and he pulled out lead balls from inside the fish, all of them, one after another after another. And the cheaters even stuffed in fish fillets inside the dead fish that they had caught, which was even weirder. Why even try to pretend it's all fish? That means it's okay. It's not cheating. It's fish fillets. It made no sense. And the crowd, you can see in the videos as they watch, they start going crazy. They are hopping mad. They're cursing, shouting, swearing. They are furious at the men who were cheating. So now the two men have been indicted on felony charges of cheating and attempted grand theft. That's a serious penalty. You try to cheat people or fudge your results or take people's money dishonestly or don't follow through with your business deals, there should be real consequences. Whether it's adding weights to your fish in a tournament or charging the poor too much money in ancient Israel. And just like the other people in that fishing tournament were furious at the ones who tried to cheat them, in Amos, God is furious with Israel because they had been cheating the poor. Like in verse 6, it said they had been selling even the sweepings with the wheat. And what that means is that when a merchant would like sweep up the barn, he would sweep up all the dust and the dirt and whatever 
unpleasant things or in an old funky barn into the pile of good wheat. So it seemed like there was a bigger pile of more wheat than there actually was, and he could charge more money for it. It's, it's a practice that has been around ever since of merchants putting in ingredients that really shouldn't be there so it's cheaper for them and they can fool the customers and make more money. These days, it's kind of like every few years, you hear about the investigation into some like fast food ingredients. A few years ago, we found out that things like Taco Bell's beef can hardly be considered beef or Subway's bread can barely be considered bread since they barely have enough of the real ingredients in them. And I always hate hearing those stories to hear the truth about the food that I have been eating that is barely even food. Ugh. If there's a way for corporations to cut corners and not let their customers know, you can bet they're going to do it. Sometimes on a big scale, with big consequences. On a big scale, think about the 2008 financial crisis. For example, when subprime mortgages crashed our housing market, ruined some banks, and affected countries, economies around the world. And the whole thing was based on deceit. The first level of deceit was at the ground level, when like local mortgage lenders and realtors would deceive families into making them think they could afford this house with this mortgage, even though they never could afford it and the interest rates were way too high. But they would get it signed, and then those local realtors and mortgage lenders would sell the mortgage up to a bigger bank and say, oh, this is a great investment. You'll definitely want to buy this. So the bigger bank would buy all of these mortgages and would pile them all together, even though they were subprime. And then the big banks would chop them up and sell them as shares all around the world to investors and deceive them and say, oh, there's, there's not a more secure investment in the world than the U.S. housing market. It'll never go down. These, these are like A++++ loans we're talking about here. But then, sure enough, once it crumbled on the bottom and those home loans went into default, then the whole thing came crashing down and crashing down. Much like Amos's prophecy, that underhanded behavior would come back to hurt the whole country. The same thing happened to us in 2008. One verse said, buying the poor with silver and the needy with a pair of sandals, Amos condemned. And that means drawing them in with shiny things or fancy payoffs or there's no risk at all. And then after they sign it, they've realized they've been fooled. That, of course, still happens today with things like predatory lending. Places will offer payday loans, but then sneak in such high interest rates and fees that families who were desperate in the first place can never pay them off. They can't even make the interest payments. They're so high. So then they can't pay those payments, they're taken to court, but if they try to leave work, they might lose their job, so they miss their court appointment, which means they get more fees and more fines and they can't pay those, and then they get jail time and it gets worse and worse for their whole family. It's a terrible cycle that's truly predatory. God hated it in the Bible, and I'm sure God hates it now. The merchants making money off the poor in the Old Testament were like those payday lenders or Lehman Brothers or Bear Stearns of their day, doing all kinds of unregulated business that was deceitful or morally bankrupt. And they liked doing it so much that verse 5 said people were upset that they had to wait for church to be over just so they could go back to doing business dishonestly. In our verses, it mentions things like Sabbaths and new moon, new month festivals. Those were religious holidays, so the markets were closed, and it drove the merchants crazy. They couldn't wait to get out of church just so they could keep making money. I think today it's kind of 
interestingly the opposite of that. It's the reverse. Because these days, I think businesses and stores can't wait for another holiday because holidays now are the big money makers for them. And that's why every year holiday items are put on the shelves earlier and earlier. Christmas decorations are put out in early November. Thanksgiving put out in early October. Halloween put out in, I don't know, July or something. It doesn't matter. They want to sell you all that stuff, more decorations that you need, more candy, more presents, more just stuff. But will, will getting more stuff make us happy? Is that what we need to do to be blessed by those holy days, holidays? I don't think so. The more you buy, the more you have to worry about, to keep up with, to maintain, to clean, to fix, to keep from breaking, to find space for it in your already cluttered house. So don't let the greedy merchants sway you like they did in verse 6 with silver and sandals. Instead, know where true joy comes from. The blessings and grace and love of God felt and shared in community in relationship with others. Okay, before we go, let's move from heavy warnings to some hopeful good news. I think we need some. In chapter 8, God did say, because of all the terrible things you've done to the poor, it will be terrible for you, but... At the end of chapter 9, God promises that even though Israel has suffered the consequences of their bad actions, God will not stop loving them. And one day, out of that love, God will pull them back onto their feet. Restoration is coming. That is the final message of the book of Amos, that there is hope that one day the people will eat the ripe fruit instead of being the ripe fruit, chapter 9 says. And the message for us is that even if we have fallen down so low that we are scraping the bottom of the barrel or we've even hit rock bottom, God still always wants to build you back up and help you stand. And not because you deserve it. There's nothing you can do to earn God's forgiveness, grace, power. When Jesus healed people, he didn't check to see if they were worthy or not. Let's see what you've done lately. No. He said, you're forgiven. You're healed. Go in peace. So if you are feeling like you have been eaten up or picked off or like You're just wasting away on the vine. Know that restoration is possible and restoration is coming. That God is at work to restore your life, to redeem it, to repair it, and to build you up strong. Let's pray. Oh God, we confess today that at times we have acted selfishly out of greed to try and gain more for ourselves without caring about others. We've been so worried about what we have. Do we have enough? We need some more. We just live with a mindset of scarcity which is the opposite of what you want for us. You want to pour out your blessings and power and forgiveness on us so that we can walk tall and proud with a mindset of abundance, of plenty, to know that you will always be there to help us with what we need so we don't have to worry. We don't have to be greedy. We don't have to be selfish. But we can give and serve and help And in doing so, feel even more blessings in return. Thank you for never giving up on us. Thank you for always pulling us back up when we are down. And for helping us to stand strong. 
In your name we pray. Amen. Now is the time in our worship when we respond to the message that God has been putting in our hearts today. One way that we will respond is by singing together our hymn of response. The lyrics are new. They are called, God, You Spoke Your Word Through Amos, which is very appropriate for the scripture text we've been reading. But the hymn tune will be very familiar to you. Come, all Christians be committed. Uh, it's also used with the servant song, so a very familiar, very familiar tune. We will respond by singing that together. And I encourage you to be thinking about how else God is leading you to respond. Maybe a change or a commitment, something to stop, something to start. Be praying about that today and this week. And then let us know here at the church. We'd love to encourage you, pray for you, and celebrate you as you make that change. So send us a message this week or come find me at the front as we sing. We'll be singing together, God, you spoke your word through Amos. Let us all stand as we sing. Thank you so much for joining us in worship today. Your presence and your spirit was a blessing to us and to the Lord, and we are thankful for it. We pray for you this week in whatever challenges you face and whatever life brings your way. Uh, I was reminded uh, a moment ago, um, Brenda Crawford asked us to pray for her daughter-in-law, Karen, who is going through um, some serious and severe cancer right now and they are unsure uh, what the future might hold. So we pray for Karen and for her daughter and for Brenda and Brian and all of their family. And we pray for you as well. Whatever challenge you might face in your life or your family this week, remember that you are not alone because you are loved by God and loved by us. We pray that you would be healthy this week in body and in spirit. Now let us close our worship service together by singing together our benediction song. Thank you.